Tomorrow is Martin Luther King Day. That's the day that we remember the life of our country's greatest civil rights leader. And the title of my message today is In the Minority. So if you put those two things together, you might assume that I'm preaching about racial injustice or segregation, prejudice, white privilege, one of those kind of topics. Now, I want to assure you those kind of topics should be preached about because racism is real. And while it's not as horrible as it once was, it still exists in human hearts and in social structures. Racism is wrong. It's evil. It's contrary to all we believe in as Christians. And it would be a fitting topic for today. But that's not what I'm going to preach about today. I'm going to preach about in the minority in a little different way. And I want to talk about how we Christians need a strategy for flourishing when we're in the minority. Let me tell you this story. Back in the early 80s when I was in seminary, one of my professors uh, took a group of us students, about 10 of us, on a field trip to the city of Chicago. Now, the purpose of that field trip was to shock us and expose us and to immerse us into a world that small town people like myself had never been in before. We, they were giving us a taste of big city life. And so we went to some things we'd never been to before. We went to the slums of Chicago in the morning. We went to some homeless shelters in the afternoon and we frequented some gay bars at night. We saw a slice of life we'd not seen before, a slice of life that opened our eyes and burdened our hearts. But the thing that I most remember about that trip was the day our professor took us to a rally at Jesse Jackson's Operation Push. I don't know if you remember that, but um, Jesse Jackson was quite a figure back then. He eventually ran for president. Jackson was uh, preaching that day from the stage, and he was preaching to a large crowd of people, and he was preaching about discrimination uh, that local businesses were, were involved in. And the theme of this rally was calling for a boycott of those businesses who were using discriminating practices. Now, Jesse Jackson was a, was a charismatic speaker, and the crowd was pretty amped up and was agreeing to everything he was saying. This rally was held in a great big theater with several thousand seats. The place was packed with thousands of black people, and our group of 10 were the only white faces in the entire facility. I've never felt more in the minority than I felt that day. I, was, I felt nervous, I felt a little scared, and I felt completely out of place. It's never comfortable when you are in the minority. Now, most of us on a day-to-day -day basis rarely feel this way. As middle-class white people, we travel in crowds with people who are mostly like us pretty much all the time. The people we watch on TV are just like us. The people we work with are just like us. The people we see in the grocery store look just like us. In most of life, we are not in the minority. We don't have to feel what that feels like. But the early Christians did have to deal with this experience every day of their lives, especially the Christians who lived in Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. These brave new believers in Jesus had established small churches in the Roman provinces of Asia Minor. They had established churches in the provinces of Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia. They established little churches, little Christian outposts in the midst of a vast pagan world. 
They were in the minority. They were followers of Jesus who were very different than their secular neighbors. Their beliefs were different than their neighbors. Their ethics were different than their neighbors. Their religious traditions and practices were different than their neighbors. And they were most definitely in the minority. Because of this, it made them targets of persecution. The people they lived around didn't like that they were different. The people they lived around didn't want them to be different. For an example, back in ancient days, every city had its own local gods to worship. People were expected to worship the local gods. These minority Christians living in these cities refused to bow down to those gods. And the locals questioned their love of the city. They assumed that because they wouldn't worship the gods, they were wishing some sort of trouble or evil on their city. These Christians must not care about the city they live in. This brought about real criticism and uh, to the Christians. They were scorned, they were slandered, they were pressured to conform like everyone else. These brave Christians were in the minority and thus they were persecuted. It was hard back then to be a Christian. It was hard to be outnumbered by so many people who believed different things. Now, in response to all this, the Apostle Peter wrote a letter to these beleaguered Christians who were kind of hanging on by their fingernails. Peter wrote a letter encouraging them to hang in there, keep your faith, live out your identity as Christians in an authentic way. Peter would tell them to be respectful of your neighbors, be kind to them, listen to them, but don't give in to the pressure of the persecution. Now, the letter that I'm talking about is 1 Peter. You can find it near the end of the Bible. It's located at the end of the New Testament. We're going to be working our way through this letter in the coming weeks. I'm going to preach straight through 1 Peter up until about Easter. I'm going to preach paragraph by paragraph. I would encourage you to read 1 Peter over the next few weeks. Maybe it would be a good thing for you to use in your daily Bible reading. Uh, get familiar with the book of 1 Peter. It'll help you as we preach through it. We're going to do a deep dive into the book of 1 Peter. And, the book, and this book of the Bible is going to be pretty helpful to us today. Because in 2021, we Christians often feel in the minority too. What do I mean by that? Well, I want to ask you this morning, how many Christians live in your neighborhood? How many Christians attend your child's school? And how many Christians work beside you every day in your occupation? I'm doubtful that that number is a very big number. Now, to be clear, I'm not talking about wimpy, once-a-year, half-hearted church attendees. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about people who call themselves Christian but show no evidence that they really believe. I'm not talking about people who are Christians in name only. I'm talking about people who have truly decided to follow Jesus, who are committed to their faith, and who are all in with following Jesus. How many of those people? do you know out in the world? It's likely not that many. That means you and I, as bought-in Christians, are in the minority in our culture. And we're not always looked upon that favorably. You know, there's a subtle form of disdain for people of faith these days. Christians are not really persecuted like they were in the first century, but Christians are sort of set on the corner and told to be quiet. You can believe what you believe, but keep it to yourself. Don't talk about your faith at work. Don't talk about your faith at school. You can talk about your faith at church and maybe at home, but don't try that in public. 
that Christian faith is marginalized a lot in our culture. And if you're bold about your faith, there will be pushback. What I'm saying today, friends, is that we are in the minority, so we can relate in some ways to those first century Christians that Peter is talking about. And so our theme for the next few weeks is going to be things that you need when you're outnumbered in the culture. Things that will be helpful to you as you live as one of the minority. Let me give you a quick preview of some of the topics we're going to be talking about. When you're outnumbered and when you're in the minority, there's some things that you need. You need a life-transforming goal to keep you on track. You need a holy focus to help you know how you're supposed to live. You need a growth mindset because you want to get closer to Jesus. You need a clear identity so you know what you stand for. You need a strategy for influencing the culture. You need a respect for the authority that's been put over you. You need a servant perspective about many people in life. You're going to need a persecution response strategy. What do you do when you experience a marginalization? And then finally, you need a character checklist. What is it we're aiming to become in our character? These things that I've mentioned today are all things you need for your faith to thrive when you're outnumbered. And I want you to thrive in the minority when you're outnumbered. I guess I want you to be like the Buffalo Bills because nobody circles the wagon like the Buffalo Bills. How do you operate when you have to circle the wagons? Okay, I'm speaking to outnumbered Christians. I'm speaking to Christians who are in the minority. How are you going to thrive? Well, today I'm simply going to set the stage for you. And I want you to notice what Peter calls you. He, Peter says that if you're a Christian and you follow Jesus and you're serious about your faith, this will be your lifelong experience that in this world you will not really belong. Christian, in this world you don't belong here. What's he mean by that? Well, he says several times in 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, he says, you're strangers in this world. In 1.7, he says, we're to live as strangers in the world. In 2, chapter 2, verse 11, he says, you are aliens and strangers in the world. The writer to the Hebrews picks up this theme as well. In Hebrews 11, it says, you are aliens and strangers on this earth. Paul, in the book of Philippians, has the very same idea. He uses a little bit different language. He says, your citizenship is not here. Your citizenship is in heaven. Christian, your citizenship is no longer on this planet. You are no longer a native to this world. You're now a stranger as you live here in a foreign land. When you become a Christian, this becomes your self-understanding. You need to remind yourself, I'm different. I'm supposed to be different. I'm in the minority. I hail from a different world. And that's okay. Christian, according to 1 Peter, you don't fit in. You don't belong. You are different and odd and just a little strange. <laughs> Some of you more strange than the others. Because of that, because you're different, your values, your lifestyle, your priorities, your commitment are different than your neighbors. You're not like everyone else. We need to be okay with this. Sometimes that's hard. We like to fit in. But it's okay that you are different. Now, Peter knew this personally. He knew that he was in the minority. He knew that he didn't fit in. Peter had experienced the world as a pretty nasty place. He'd been put in jail. He'd been beaten on occasion. P 
Peter would eventually be crucified upside down. Imagine that. As Peter was about to be crucified, he asked to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy to be crucified in the same way that Jesus was crucified. Peter knew he was different. And he knew the world that he lived in was all messed up. He had watched Christians be persecuted beside himself. He had watched Christians be murdered and tortured, fed to the lions. Peter knew that this world was a messed up place, that he didn't belong here and we don't fit in. Today, our world is messed up. Not in the same way, but it's still messed up. There's something wrong with the world we live in. There's something wrong with a world where school shootings are common. In a world where riots happen in our cities, where racism is alive and well, where pornography is just a click away, where con men will call you on the phone and try to scam you out of your money, where TV sitcoms teach adultery and promiscuity, where politics is so bloodthirsty, and where nuclear weapons exist that could could destroy the world in a minute. Our world is a messed up place. There's something wrong with our world. We all seem to hate each other. We're mean and attacking on social media and everybody's looking out for number one. The world is messed up. There's something fundamentally wrong with the world we live in. Frankly, friends, I don't want to fit in to that kind of a world. I don't want to belong. I want to be a citizen of something else. I want to feel like a stranger and an alien in the world I live in. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 13, says this. Let me quote it to you. He's talking about the early Christian. They admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they are longing, longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Friends, we long for a different world. We long for a better country. We long for our real home. I quoted this, oh, I have quoted this old hymn before, but I'm going to quote it again. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Friends, that's why the church is so very important to us as Christians. And I want to tell you, never, ever underestimate the importance of the gathered church, especially during COVID when we're scattered, when you are off on your own, when you are doing church on your couch and you're isolated from other Christians. You've just got Pastor Jeff on the TV you don't have other people to gather with. No gathered community. No conversations in the foyer. No catching up on the lives of others. It's Christianity all alone and all by yourself. Maybe your small group isn't meeting that much anymore. Maybe you don't have much contact with church people and that's dwindling. And you are trying to do the Christian faith on your own. Never underestimate the importance of the gathered church. The church is our home away from home. The church is our little colony of people who are in the minority, who need each other. The church is that tiny community living in the midst of the sea of secular people. The church is our gathering place where we can feel home even when we're not in our ultimate home yet. We need each other right now, especially now. And we need each other gathered physically. And there are people in the church who gather 
physically. And I can tell you when they gather physically in church, even though it's a small number, they hang out because they need to be together. We need to gather virtually. If that's how you need to gather, you need some friends online, some Christians online. You need to be calling each other. You need to be talking to each other. You need to be texting each other. You need to gather virtually. We need to gather somehow, in some way, in whatever way makes sense to us. Never underestimate the importance of the gathered church and never stop gathering in some way. It is critical because this world is not your home and you are in the minority. You are outnumbered and we need to gather together. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the church. We thank you for the gathered people of Christ who are our oasis in the midst of the outnumbered society we live in. And Lord, we're looking forward to our home in heaven, but we're not there yet. And so we look forward to our home in the church. Lord, we thank you today and help us as we go through 1 Peter. As we are in the minority, as we're outnumbered, as we uh, need a lot of things to thrive in this environment. Uh, help us indeed to thrive. For it's in Christ's name we pray.